You're sitting in the back room of a theater, dressed in heavy black robes, your luscious red hair contained by a thick hood, nibbing on an iced coffee. Behind you, an imbos positioned next to the door, with a professional expression, trying his damnness to not as much as look at you. The silence in the room occasionally interrupted by the sounds of your drinking. You had awoken early today. It wasn't often that you were called for a job. There was a certain anxiousness that you felt. Mistakes, blunders, screwing up. The theatrics always made you feel terrible for weeks. Though it had been a while since the last time you did that. Nonchalantly, you began expecting your right wrist. As if the little hidden claw beneath your skin had vanished since the last time you checked. Pressing on a barely visible skin pouch, the black stinger shot out of your skin. It was a shiny obsidian black. A tiny, almost unnoticeable hole at its furthest tip. You had tried stabbing yourself with it once, though it seemed like you were immune to your own power. It just really hurt. Five more minutes, Miss Blackwall, said the imp after checking his watch. You attracted the stinger by fully straightening your hand. It was good that you purposefully needed to touch the little skin pouch, otherwise this thing could have been quite inconvenient when it came to personal contacts, as well as sleeping. You leaned back in your chair, sighing loudly. When had it been again? Two days ago? Four? Perhaps a week. That was your minimum requirement for your recruitment contracts, though you had trouble keeping up with dates. You lived at the top floor of an amazing apartment tower, right in the middle of the gang territory of Carmilla Carmine, though you didn't have any preferences when it came to the overlords. After all, you needed to remain neutral, part of the job. Camilla just had more classy accommodations than most, and she always was a little more generous when it came to jobs. Really, sometimes you saw yourself as her third daughter with how well she treated you. Of course, you never say that out loud or to her face. She slit your tongue. You had lazily been drifting in and out of sleep when the call came. You had been lying on an inflatable mattress inside your pool. For the great luxury you experienced in hell, you were expected to jump onto any job. That's why you were here. The five minutes were over, and the imp opened the door, allowing you passage. Like the image of death itself, you made your way through a dim yet lavishly decorated hallway, covered in posters of plays and movies you had never seen, most of them hell productions, though some of them, such as Casablanca, came from Earth. After taking your final breath, you stepped onto the stage. Your first look went over the audience. Only a handful of the most powerful overlords had gathered. Most of them sitting in the front row, aside from two of them. Hmm, let's see. Who's here? There were the V's, all three of them. Rosie, of course. Zessiel never skipped a performance. Two members of the Eldritch family, and far in the back, sitting with a young blonde woman, said... Alistair the Radio Demon? Ah, uh, you haven't seen him in seven years. Ah, uh, good to see an old friend. Well, friend wasn't really the right word. Acquaintance? Finally, your eyes went over the person chained on a singular chair in the middle of the stage, all lights of the theater pointing at them. It was a woman. She had beautiful orange skin blue lips and blonde hair. She was dressed like one of Valentino's girls, with white freckles and green eyes. You remained out of sight of her, while everyone else was staring at you with bated breaths. 
What was happening here? This wasn't a play. No. You approached the chained woman from behind. She shivered and started screaming as she finally noticed you. Gently you slid the back of your hand down her cheek. Patiently, Rosie leaned forward, taking out her theater glasses to exactly see the facial reactions of the bound woman. A loud popping noise rang through the theater as Valentina opened a bottle of alcohol. But everyone was too enamored by what was happening on stage to be bothered by it. This wasn't a play. No. This was an execution. The demoness before you must have committed a grave sin that presumably all overlords gathered here desired this woman's demise, or at least democratically agreed on this being proper punishment. Well, considering Alistair was sitting still in the theater, there was the certain exception that he was just here for sick pleasure and would have agreed to any execution. To stop the woman screaming, you place her hand on her chin, clapping her jaws shut. You inspected her carefully. She was a very basic demoness, sinner born, no special features aside from her discolored skin and strange looking eyes, looking a little like those of horses. She had two small horns poking out of her forehead. They had signs of being cut. Who was it again who ordered her to be executed? Aya yeah, Vox, right, the TV demon. Just in case your eyes started over to him, he was leaning forward in his chair, his mouth was turned into a vile grin. Eyes not even blinking. Well, better not keep the audience waiting. The tension could be cut with a knife. Besides, this wasn't your first time in this specific place of execution. Normally it was some dingy serial killer-like basement or an interrogation room beneath a nightclub. Each overlord having their own execution place. Vox, the TV demon, was one for theatrics, so perhaps that's why he used this old opera-style theater for it. I'm going to explain what will happen to you. Even though you spoke directly into the ear of your victim, everyone in the theater heard your voice. It was thanks to the microphone attached to the rope given to you by Vox. I don't know why you have been called for execution. Nor do I care. Remain quiet. This will make the process more easy on all of us. Your grip on the woman's chin slowly lessened. While she stopped screaming in fear, she now threw herself against her restraints, but to no avail. The chair was bolted to the floor, her powers, if she had any, suppressed by her shackles. You shook your head. Well, to be fair, you were dead the second they put me on this, you muttered. No point in fighting. So about this. See, sometimes tearing a soul apart is enough for dear makers. Sometimes they want a more permanent solution. You're probably wondering how. Chuckling, you hugged her from behind, placing your chin on her shoulder and smiling. See, we have to be creative down here in H E double L. Physical harm is out of the question, as that only leads to regenerations. The same thing goes with poison. Eventually, it's out of the system. Smirking, you kissed her neck. Her skin tasted pleasant, was quite warm. Such a shame. For a moment, you forgot you were in the theater. Sharing an intimate moment with the woman you are about to kill. But there are other means. Addiction is a really popular one. Sometimes forced. Practically always forced if we use it as an execution method. Uh, Zestiel's adopted daughter can make you want to self-delete over and over again whenever you regenerate. Though technically you can recover from that. And if you can suppress it enough, you can live... A miserable life, after decades, maybe. 
And then there's memory removal. It's one that Carmilla really likes to use, but... Your hands move down to the woman's curvy body. My niece worries. You let go of her, walking around her, until you're face to face with her. You're pressed into the skin pouch, your stinger shooting out. It glistened in the stage lights. See, memory removal still technically allows the gaining of new memories. Of a new self. New person. Sure, the demon might be reduced to a newborn intelligence and knowledge-wise, but you can come back from that eventually. And in very rare cases, the memories just suddenly return. That is a possibility. Even though memory parasites devour the memories whole, it just happens. You went down on one knee, placing both hands on her thighs, making sure to scrape her skin with the stinger as you did. What I do, you can never come back from. You said in a serious tone while staring right into her eyes. And then you smiled up at her. Tell me, sweetie. What is your best personality trait? Uh, what? She hushed. To her, this felt more. To her, this felt very out of context, but it was important. I... I suppose I'm quite self-sufficient. Well, at least she taught you an extra personality trait. It was rare that in hell somebody actually told you a personality trait. Ugh. Gently you patted her left knee with your right hand. Good answer. With an evil grin you stood up and walked behind her again. And you gently brushed the back of your fingers against her cheek. Soon this will all be over. But don't worry. I seldom get any complaints. The girl's eyes contracted out of fear. Placing her left onto her head. She froze. Her gaze forward. And finally. You placed the long black stinger against her neck. Her body wiggled out of fear. But there was no way out of this. It pierced her skin. Her body shivering in pain. You pushed forward. Drilling. Shoving. Tearing. Until you felt the resistance of her spine. And then the instance it made contact with her bones, it happened. The woman's body convulsed. She screamed, but it was no longer in pain. Everybody could tell. It was as if the second the needle touched her bones, everything was turned upside down. Every neuron in her body fired. It was the most intense feeling she ever felt. Her eyes rolled back, foam pouring out of her mouth. This feeling was beyond bliss, beyond pleasure. Every millisecond felt like hours of pure ecstasy. From somewhere behind you, the imp from earlier approached. He was holding a bowl, shoving it under the woman's chin. You twisted your stinger, causing even more neurons to fire. She could feel it, her brain melting in the endless drowning river of pleasure. She clenched her teeth, inhaling through them, clenching so hard cracks appeared on them, some of them falling out, falling right next to the ball. As blood began seeping past her lips, she bit off a piece of her tongue, and yet she couldn't stop. She couldn't stop boning, screaming. Her movements became more erratic. And then, from one moment to the next, they ceased entirely. Limp, she sat there. A pink substance, 
beginning to pour out of her eyes like tears. The bowl slowly catching the pink liquid as it slowly dripped out of the woman. Personality excretion, the heretical process of sealing oneself, it was permanent, irreversible, leaving the demon a mere husk. This was the power granted to you by hell. It was an ill mutation of memory parasites who were closest demonic relatives, biologically speaking. The overlords in the theater clapped for you, but... One. The little blonde girl next to Alistair, she was... vomiting into a barf bag. How cute. Reminded you a little of yourself. The first time you did this. Oh well. If Alistair had interest in her, she wouldn't need to get used to this. What a wonderful show. Certainly more entertaining than any picture show Alistair had ever seen. And this wasn't even your best performance yet. Still, he had been happy to be here. Though it seemed his companion, Charlie, wasn't agreeing with him. The moment she realized this was an execution, she had grabbed onto Alistair's arm, sobbing into his coat. Something he'd usually punish with zero abandon, but it was Charlie, so he made an exception. Besides, her cries were very sweet, like the cherry on top of a dessert. But why was Charlie even here? Well, that was all thanks to Lucifer. Back when hell was a place of torture and hellborn were actually a force to be reckoned with, executions such as memory deletion needed to be requested directly to the royal family. This fate at the time was considered worse than death, which it technically is, and was used very sparingly. Especially because the result of memory deletion was considered a... a baby. And that brought an entirely new dilemma, as sad adult baby could no longer be considered the same sinner. Though none of the memory deleted subjects suddenly went to heaven, so it seemed God still saw them as the tainted souls they were when their brains still functioned normally. Nevertheless, to request an execution, a majority of overlords had to agree with it. And then the royal family had the final say in it. Problem was, Lucifer didn't care, especially since Lilith left him. Sun, okay, was given no matter what. It was at this point just business. However, a member of the royal court had to attend the execution to ensure that it actually happened. Normally, Lucifer's royal butler, a strange imp by the name of Priminger, attended executions, but he was busy creating a leg within the castle's walls. And Lucifer hasn't attended one of these in about a thousand years. Specifically the 11th century. Around that time, the final Christianization of Scandinavia occurred, creating the peace and truce of God movements. Uh, truthfully, he just got bored of them. And so Charlie needed to attend her first execution. Though the way she understood it, it was some royal attendance thing, maybe with cocktails, some light music, but not this. She should have been more suspicious of the fact that Alistair wanted to be part of this. Really, really badly. Why? muttered Charlie into his coat. Ah, sorry, darling, I didn't listen when they read the sentencing during the vote. Seriously? You voted for this, didn't you? Chai looked up at the husk of the woman. She was staring blankly into the darkness. I'm sorry, Charlie, said Alistair as he stood up. 
but I just simply have to speak with Miss Blackwall. It has been ages since I saw her performance. Without another look, Alistair descended the steps. For a smug look towards Vox, who was still sitting there with a pleased expression, staring at the husk, but to the radio demon's surprise, Vox didn't react at all, probably too pleased by the performance, considering that he was the one desiring the execution. Perhaps that's why his mood was so high. He didn't give a single fuck about Alistair right now. Oh well, maybe just today he would accept that. With a smirk, Alistair walked into the hallway with all the VIP changing rooms, though he was for a moment distracted by one of the posters. Impressed, he nodded. It wasn't advertising, the black and white movie Nosferatu. Sure, Alistair might not enjoy today's overstimulation, but classic picture shows such as that one were acceptable in his book. From behind him, he heard a door open. Finally, changing his attention back to his initial goal. Ah, Miss Blackwall, darling. You had just stepped out of your room. Alistair, you said positively surprised. You approached him. It's been a while. Yes, darling, it has been indeed. Where have you been? The two of you started walking deeper into the carcass of the building. Well, I suppose you could say it's semi-retirement, but I'm back for now, mostly. I actually offer my services for a little enterprise. Solely for my amusement, of course. He sounded excited. Oh, really? You stopped at the back door exit, your hand resting on the handle. Oh, darling, I am here with a companion. I can't leave her behind. But we simply have to catch up, darling. You nodded absent-mindedly. Well, perhaps. Uh, where can I find you? His grin widened. The has been hotel, darling. Uh, make sure you come after hours. This way you avoid... Annoyances. You tilted your head. You had heard about it. Apparently its residents were the reason the last extermination not only came six months early, but also was repelled. Your interest was piqued. Explain. He waved with his left hand mockingly. Ah, that is better discussed over something alcoholic. <laughs> something classy. Scotch or wine. Whiskey. <laughs> Almost sounds like you want to go on a date with me. His eyes widened and he hissed. <sighs> Darling, I don't do dates. Oh, I know that. But I only do dates. After all, I'm a very busy person and... I don't leave the house unless there is a reason. Ugh. Dates always come with the expectation of... Exchanging bodily fluids. I just see myself above that. He crossed his arms and thought. Though perhaps I can make an exception. Just for you, Blackwall, darling. He sighed, exasperated. Uh, I'm just such a fan of your work, I suppose. <sighs> Fine. If the night ends there, I can suffer for it. Just once. You chuckled to yourself, pressing down the exit lever. Well then, see you soon. Knowing Alistair, it would be a shame letting him wait for too long, considering that he would always be ready for you. So you saw no issue when you arrived at the hotel late at night, two days later. It was a nice place, quite modern. You walked over red carpets into a large, lavishly decorated lobby. To your left was a bar, and to your right, the reception. At the bar slept a familiar face. Husk. One of Alice's little playthings, though he woke up when the doorbell rang, indicating somebody entered the building. He was looking at you. His eyes tired, 
looking you up and down. I think you have the wrong address. Smirking, you crossed your arms. Oh, really? A monster like you doesn't just come here to... From beneath the bar, a black tentacle had shot up from the ground. Husk, 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 don't run your mouth on our guest here. Chuckled Alistair as he placed his hand on your shoulders from behind. Your eyes widened. Had he been hiding behind the reception or did he teleport? His fingers dug into your flesh, making you inhale sharply. The tentacle loosened its grip on the cat demon's throat, allowing him to speak. Oscar, my friend, I would really enjoy it if you could keep this little visit for yourself. If Charlie or that spider hear about me having a lady visit, I will never hear the end of it. The cat grumbled, causing Alistair to snap his fingers. Green shackles immediately peering all around the cat, squeezing tightly. Are we clear? C -c Crystal clear, boss. The chains vanished. Good, my man. Come, Blackwall. Darling, we have a lot to catch up on. You followed the radio demon, who was headed to the elevator. He pressed a button somewhere in the middle of the building. I have the entire floor to myself. No one will interrupt us. What happened to that pocket dimension of yours? He gave you a look that felt like he was saying, Bitch, please. And by it alone, you could instantly tell that he probably moved the dimension into his actual room. You liked Alistair's pocket dimension. It was like a small field with a gazebo in it. Of course, you were fully aware of the fact that you received special treatment from him and the other overlords. And you knew that the moment you were no longer useful to the overlords, they would drop you like a hot potato. Though there was something about Alistair that made you feel like that, for him, this wasn't the case. Though, this did leave a bitter taste in your mouth whenever you interacted with the other overlords. Alistair was humming as he stepped out of the elevator, you close behind. Walking forward, you opened the door right in front of it, leading you into a fusion of his dimension and what used to be the hotel room. As expected, a large field stretched out before you seemingly endlessly, a wooden wall with lamps going on forever behind you. Large bookshelves were scattered around the place. The area had what seemed to be a glass ceiling through which you could see the night sky with twinkling stars, which didn't make sense as you were right in the middle of a hotel. From previous visits in the dimension, you knew this pocket space was almost lazily drowned in this eternal night, causing the stars to remain in place. This... This space was really screwing with your brain. And while you enjoyed your stay, whenever you left Alistair's pocket dimension, an eerie feeling overcame you. Like this place, it shouldn't exist. It was a liminal feeling. A feeling of, I should never have gotten there. Of course, other overlords had their own pocket dimension, though they exchanged space for luxury. You remembered one time, though, you had been here while you were strolling with the radio demon, that the gazebo repeated. So it was more like an infinite looping room, still big enough that one had to really pay attention to where the cutoff point truly was, but still. Now, uh, darling, said Alistair, as the two of you sat down beneath the gazebo, it already had a neatly prepared cart of alcohol beneath it. How did the last seven years treat you, my darling? You took a glass and then hovered your hand over his fine selection of drinks. Well, I suppose I would say quite well. You smiled, though your oval expression remained neutral. 
You grabbed a whiskey that you knew from experience was quite fruity in taste despite the burn. I moved into a bigger place in Camilla's area of influence. She keeps the streets clean enough for me not to be bothered. Does it have a pool? He mused knowingly. Of course it has. You know this is my minimum requirement. Your conversation carried on. He obviously was hiding something whenever the conversation returned to him and why he so suddenly retired, but it was too pleasant of a night. You didn't want to upset him. Though the conversation became interesting when all of a sudden he commented. It's interesting to me how to this day you let your human life influence your decision-making in hell. You exhaled your heart beating faster as a blush began to decorate your cheeks. You had been drinking way too much to not instantly recognize what he meant, and so your inebriated brain made you have an emotional outburst. I'm the type of person who uses the my parents told me to think like this, or my mom would have done said or thought the same thing lines as an excuse for dumb decisions. You averted your gaze. Just in the hope someone tells me they are horrible people. Of course, at the same time, small things like the pool or the air conditioning. Out of the reason that my parents would have never done that, I pretend I do myself, but the line between did I just do this because I wanted to or because they didn't want me to it's always there. You're in hell for a reason, darling. You leered at him. What does that mean? You took another sip while he snickered to himself. That's why I like you, darling. All the choices you make have two underlying goals. Either it's to piss off two people who may or may not right now be sitting in heaven sipping on a golden tea... Or to make other people despise them. Quietly, Radio Demon added, What oh, trauma dumping? Your eyes met Alistair's. If they are in heaven, you said out loud, You guys repelled the angels. We can fight them. Your mouth twitched into a smile. And when we do, and they happen to cross my side because they're up there. Your hands were shaking and unintentionally your stinger shot out your hand, destroying the glass you were holding, covering your hand in shards and sticky, stinging alcohol. Ah, uh, sorry! Immediately we're pulled back to reality, no longer feeling drunk, almost instantly. Ah, oh, it's okay, darling. Your hand was bleeding, and before you could do or say anything, he grabbed it, holding it up. Gently, he began removing the shards, his eyes entirely focused on your hand. You inhaled slowly through your mouth. Finally, he removed the last shard with some tweezers. There you go, darling. Smirking, he leaned his head down, kissing the back of your hand, causing you to gasp in pain, but... Alistair stopped moving. His lips pressed against your skin. Your expression became soft. You cannibals are all the same, huh? Just a little taste of human blood and your entire personality changes. You shouldn't have said that. As if to prove you're right, a string of salvia ran down his chin. He pulled away, his body shaking, almost unnoticeably. <laughs> Please don't compare me to that riffraff, darling. You smirked, tilting your head. What would Rosie think if she heard you say that? He slapped both hands on the table, his face coming dangerously close to yours. Well, she won't. His animalistic side was barely contained now. And so, you narrowed your eyes and said, 
Make me not tell her. Almost immediately you could feel Alistair's overwhelming presence. Violently he grabbed your cheeks, his claws painfully digging into your flesh. And then he pressed his mouth on yours. He made sure to not make it romantic. It was violent and tasty. His tongue swished and swirled inside your mouth while his teeth gnashed and bit at any attempt at you trying to receive any kind of conventional pleasure out of this. Still, you moaned while he grunted, pushing you onto the table before he climbed on top of it. You were completely defenseless against him. He was pinning you down, but you didn't mind it. Neither did you mind when his claws ripped through the tight cocktail dress you had been wearing, his hands violently gripping your chest, kneading your flesh, tearing and pulling. You screamed in pleasure and pain as his teeth sunk into your shoulders. Oh, God, I love being right! You grunted, accepting the pleasure. He was giving you. Thank you for watching my video until the very end. And I would like to remind you to please like and subscribe and comment something down below. I read every comment you write to me and I try to re reply to them as often as I can. But before we say goodbye, I would like to shout out all of my lovely darling stewards who so graciously support my third tier membership. Husky HD 17, Hopeful, Castea Misery, Bree, Zoe, Ikea, Mystic Jade 111, Annabelle R. Contreras, Giovanni Moriarty, Twilight Mia, Angry Boxman, Hella, Bit Bit, Melofia, Anonymous Weep, and Nicodemus D. Thank you so much for your continued support. And finally, I'd like to thank all of my lovely darling mates for also supporting me financially. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you very much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day and please remember to like and subscribe.